Good morning, Sayre Woods Bible Church. It is so glad to be here this morning, and I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces out there, as well as some faces I'm not as familiar with. I'm glad you're here, but let's start with prayer, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, I'd ask that the words I speak are your words, and that there's a blessing there that we can take as a church Lord, so that we can have fruit that is truly from you. Lord, please be with us as we talk about this and keep me on track. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you've been with us at all, and let's make sure I have my clicker on here. If you've been with us at all these last eight weeks, you know that we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And when Pastor Dan, a number of months ago, had presented this idea that we were going to have different men from the church speak on different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, I was really excited about that opportunity. Um, that is until I found out what fruit I was going to be doing. Now, there's a rumor that another one of the speakers, whose name is very similar to my own, said, I'll do any of the fruit, just don't give me self-control. And that's our final fruit, kind of batting cleanup here today, is we're going to be talking about the fruit of self-control. So let's start off by actually looking at the passage that we've been going over these last couple of months. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, I also happen to work with the middle school kids, and we just so happen that they're also going through Galatians in a video series that we're doing down there, and they know all the fruit by heart. They have this song that they've memorized. I can never get it by heart. But we're finally down to the last fruit, and it's a fruit of self-control. And for me, that brought up the question, what is the fruit of self-control? That doesn't seem obvious. So I know I run the risk of embarrassing my kids, but when I found out I was doing self-control, the first thing that came into my mind was actually a comic book hero that, from a comic book that I used to read a lot as a kid. And the comic was the G.I. Joe comics, and my favorite character in the G.I. Joe comics was a character by the name of Snake Eyes. Now, Snake Eyes didn't have magical powers. He wasn't an alien. He didn't have a special suit. Rather, Snake Eyes was a regular Joe who had been trained by ninjas. And because of that, he had perfect control over his body. He could be completely silent if he wanted to. He could move and you wouldn't be able to see him. Then he could break into action and do all kinds of amazing things because he had control over his body. So I asked, God, is the power of being a ninja what you mean here? And my... 10-year-old self would be disappointed, but today I'm kind of glad that I don't have to be a ninja. That's not what God intends for me. Now, it doesn't mean that ninjas can't be used by God. And of course, I don't know if there's any ninjas out there today because you're ninjas, I can't see you. But, but nonetheless, that's not what I think Paul is talking about here in Galatians chapter 5. So the next thing I thought of, another thing that I happen to like quite a bit, is basketball. And if you'd watched the most recent playoff series, there was a player on one of the teams who was kind of renowned for having seemingly great control over his emotions. In a couple of the series, things weren't going well, but he never seemed flustered. He never seemed to show any emotion about the difficulty he was facing. And then when the team did really well and they started winning games, he didn't seem flustered by that as well. In interviews, he always had one-word responses. He seemed to have great control over his emotions. And of course, his team went on and won, and he was named MVP, and he still seemed to have great control. So is that what God's talking about here? That I can control my emotions and potentially be an NBA superstar? Well, that's, I don't think, what Paul's talking about here either. That's not the fruit of self-control. Now, the next step I went is probably where most of you go when you think about self-control. You think about things like diets and exercise. And if you're a student, you think about doing homework, and you say, 
the self-control is what allows me to do that thing that I really don't want to do. So when I don't want to get up early in the morning and go running or whatever it is people do for exercise, I wouldn't know. Um, or if I do want to eat that extra donut and choose not to, that's self-control. And that self-control is really about robbing fun from my life. Self-control is me having no enjoyment in life because I have these goals I have to keep and self-control keeps me on track. Is that what God's talking about with self-control? And I don't think that's it either. Not that that type of self-control isn't needed sometimes, but I don't think that's where Paul was at when he was talking about the fruit of self-control. So that still leaves us with the question is, well, that's not the question. Uh, uh, I missed the slide, I apologize. It still leaves us with the question is, what is the fruit of self-control? Now, I think part of the answer is actually found in this passage on Galatians. We know that Paul is talking to the churches of Galatia, and he's talking to them about how they identify themselves and what they're doing in their churches, what they're doing as Christians. And specifically, he's talking about how when they're doing things, are they doing them through the power of God, or are they making decisions doing things through their own power? And he gives them this list as a way to judge whether their actions are of God or whether their actions are of the flesh. And how we judge them is because when we're doing them through God, and this is all stuff that you know because we've been going over it eight weeks, that these are things that show God's attributes. And so if you think about them, some are kind of obvious. We, we talk about God is love, right? That's the big one. God is love, and because God is love, that's his attribute. I can show love to other people. Not because I have the power to love someone that I would have a really hard time loving, but because God can work through me and I can show love. It talks about God is peace. And that's also easy. We can say, God is peace. And so even when times are, I'm having difficulty, I'm having indecision in my life, like when I'm trying to figure out what self-control is, I can still have peace. That's obvious. So when we get to the end of the list and it says that there's an attribute of self-control, we know that must be an attribute of God himself. It has to be somehow that self-control is an attribute of God. And so based off that, I said, well, what attributes of God do I know? Well, one of the attributes of God I know is that God is all-powerful. And that's a story that's throughout the Bible. I probably don't need to let, you know, prove that to you. But in Exodus 6, and I, let me get my verse here, Exodus 6, verses 2 and 3, when God is convincing Moses that he can go and talk to Pharaoh, he talks to him about how God is the God of his fathers and refers to himself with the name El Shaddai, or God the Most Powerful, or the All-Powerful. So God is powerful, all right? We'll, we'll take that as a given, and if you don't believe me, please go look into it yourself. And the second aspect of God that came to mind was that God never changes. And we see this in the Bible quite a bit, too. And in fact, one of the verses that I found, and this book doesn't get a lot of play in sermons, is in the book of Malachi, Chapter 3, verse 6, and it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Now he's talking to there about how he's going to work with the Jews and how he's going to what the plan he has for them. And he's saying, Because I don't change, you don't have to worry about what my plans are for you because they won't change either. So he's saying that I am the Lord, I don't change. And there's other passages. Hebrews talks about it as well. He says, for Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And then in James, one of my favorite books, it also says the same thing, that God has no variableness. He doesn't change. So, all right, God is all-powerful, and God doesn't change. How does that help me with self-control? And then I found this verse, and I think this is a key verse for understanding God's attribute of self-control. It's found in Isaiah, and I'm going to read it to you here so I don't mess it up. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven, whoop, there we go, and does not return without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed to the sower and bread so to the eater. So my word, and this is the key point why I'm bringing up this passage, so my word that goes out of my mouth will not return to, you, to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire. What God is saying here is he's trying to convince the Israelites that they need to trust in him. But what God is saying here is he's saying that I have a purpose 
and the purpose that I set out will be accomplished. My goals, my will will happen. And that is what I think the aspect of self-control is. So if we think about it back with our diet example, if I purpose to lose weight, and then I have the power to go out and do the things I need to do to lose weight and actually lose weight, you would call that that I had self-control. And I think that's what this is, is God is saying that he is an attribute of self-control and that he will do what he intends to do. Well, the question is, how does that relate to me? How does that attribute of self-control impact my life? So I think the answer is also found in the Bible. So if we go to Jeremiah 29.11, it says... For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So what God is saying, at least how I interpret this, is God is saying that I have a purpose and a will, and I want you to be a part of it. He wants us to be part of his will, and that's why he gives us this power of self-control so we can be part of his will. In the church, though, and this is the rub. In the church, we have a term for when people are outside of God's will, when people are accomplishing their own plans and their own purpose instead of God's purpose. It's a very simple word. It starts with an S and ends with an N, and we call it sin. And unfortunately, we see all the time, starting with the very beginning of man's history, that man has tried to do things on his own, and it leads to sin. So, Going back to the very first man and the very first sin, in Genesis 3, Adam chose to eat the fruit. And God tells him, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you not, all these things are going to happen. And he goes through the list of what is going to be the results of sin in the world. The start of that initial sin, what the results are. Why? Because God had a plan and a purpose. It was for Adam not to eat the fruit. But Adam ate the fruit and thus leading to sin. And literally, Adam's son faced the same problem. Cain was a farmer. He wanted to do something good. He wanted to offer back a, a blessing, a sacrifice back to God. And he says, I grow fruit, I grow grains. I'll offer these as a sacrifice to God. But God said, that's not my plan. And when his brother came, and he offered a lamb as a sacrifice, God said, that's my plan. And Cain couldn't handle it. And so Cain sinned. And we know what happens there. I mean, something that seems unbelievable for a brother to kill a brother, but that's the result of sin. Now, sin causes an initial problem for us, because sin makes us unworthy to God. And there's a, that's a gulf that we can't overcome. But, of course, we know that Jesus Christ overcame that gulf for us. And, and certainly, part of that is being saved and actually becoming a child of God. And, I, and I, the sermon isn't really about that, but that's obviously a very first and important step that you need to take. But even after we've taken that step, we still have this problem, is that when we're not following God's plan, we're still subject to sin. But God wants to help us with that, too. So if we look at Romans 6, verses 12 through 14, it says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin should not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And then in 1 Peter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says something very similar. It says, Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind for he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, or he has gained power over sin, so that when we live, we can also live with power over sin. So we know that God has a plan, and I skipped my slide, I apologize, and we know that sin is what happens when I try to deviate from God's plan, but God doesn't want us to stay there. All right, so given all of that, and given that's the idea behind self-control and spiritual self-control, how does that what does that look like in our lives? Well, I think the key here is having power over sin. And how do I need to have power over sin? Now, if any of you were children who had a Lego set, or if you have kids who have Lego sets, 
you know they come with instructions. There's the nice little picture boxes, and in the first one it tells you putting the first pieces together, all the way to the end where you're putting the final pieces together, and, and hopefully if you did it right, the thing you have at the end looks a lot like the picture on the box. So we're going to take that approach to looking about how we conquer sin in our lives. But instead of starting with the first picture, we're going to start with the very last picture. So, starting with the very last picture, the very bottom of the list of what happens when sin is in control of our lives is that we are doing sins with our body, all right? Now, you say that's obvious, all right? Yes, you know, sins with my body are bad. They're outside of God's plan. I mean, there's all the big ones here. James 1.21, and this is one of my favorite uh, um, books of the Bible, says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So the idea here is really simple. We need to put aside all those things that we had been doing with our bodies before we were saved, and we need to have get rid of that filth. Now, one of the areas of sin, specifically talking about sins that manifest with actions, is sexual immorality. And the Bible talks a lot about that. And I believe it talks a lot about that because it knows that's a challenge for us. Now, being a man, I have a perspective. I know the challenge that there is out there with sex, all right? And the Bible speaks about that directly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 and 20, it says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whosoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Do not, do not know, and this is why I love this passage, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And very similarly, in Romans 12, 1 and 2a, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, and, uh, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. So it's pretty obvious. We don't need to, we should not be doing sins with our body. And part of self-control is not doing those things. And the reason I start with this one, and the reason I mention it at all, because what does a Christian look like who is doing sins like we've talked about here? What does he look like? He looks just like the world. And more importantly, his fruit... And Okay, I'm going to give you a little teaser here. I'm going to give my own version of what I think the fruit is. All right? But I'm not going to tell you to the end, and I'll give you a hint. It involves plumbing. All right? Anyways, back to this. He says your fruit will be non-spiritual fruit. It won't at all be the fruit of God. It's going to be fruit of the flesh. It's going to be bad fruit. So we know that it's not. we, we have to have control over our bodies. The next Lego step, or the previous Lego step, is keeping from sinning with our tongues. Now, if we look into self-control through the Bible, control over our tongues is mentioned almost more than anything else. It's over and over again, it talks about having to have control over our tongues. If we go back to, and if I can find what page I'm on, if we go back to Psalms, David says in 141.3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, Keep watch over the door of my lips. Literally, keep my tongue in jail, God, so it doesn't do anything bad. And then his son, in Proverbs 13, 3, says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips will have destruction. So, obviously, the tongue's a danger. But probably one of the best-known passages on control over the tongue is found in James chapter 3, verses 3 through 10. And it's a long passage, so I'm not going to read it all, but basically it says, just like we can use the bit in a horse's mouth to control a very large animal, or just like a rudder controls a ship, the tongue can have control over our lives. And that control can often be very, very destructive, just like a spark can destroy an entire force. And it leads on to say that with our tongues, we bless God, doing good things, and then we also curse God men who are made in the likeness of God, and how that's a bad thing, and how we can't have that in our lives. We need to have control over our tongues, especially in the church. That control is very important, because we probably, and I'm hoping, don't have too many people running around committing murder in the church. That's not something we're doing, and hopefully those other big sins, we're trying to have control over those, but 
we have control of our tongues in the church, oftentimes we don't. We'll say things like, well, I was only speaking the truth. Or somebody needed to say something. Or I really didn't mean to hurt you when I said that. And yet all the times, control of our tongues is a problem that we need to fight. All right, so that's pretty obvious. You can agree with me on that one. What's the next step? Control over our eyes. Now, I say this, um, and uh, unfortunately, I found this to be true. Uh, most of my life, I've been working in a professional setting, and a lot of that time I spent working around other men, all right? And even with groups I've been associated with, and even in some cases, families, I'll find men, especially married men, who will say something like, I can look as long as I don't touch. But that is not God's perspective. What we look at can drive us to sin. And looking itself can be sin. In fact, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That just looking can be a sin. And it's not just about lust. It can be anything I look at that would drive me outside of God's will. If I really, really want something, and I think that this is what I need, but I know it's not part of God's will, I shouldn't be looking at it. And it drives to our final point, because the things I look on are the things I'm thinking about. And that's really where control matters. This is the heart of using or channeling God's power of self-control in our heart. It's about controlling our mind. If we go back to that verse in Romans 12, specifically focusing on verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, isn't that what self-control is all about, keeping God's will? So what do I need to do to keep God's will? I need to control my mind. And how do I control it? By this word, renewing. Now, you've probably heard this passage before. I know I have. And I was thinking, what does renewing my mind really mean? And I have another analogy I'm going to share with you. If you are 17 in the state of New Jersey, or 16 anywhere else in the United States, you probably are very interested in doing one thing, and that's in driving a car. And if you were driving my car today, you'd see a little sticker on the windshield that has a number that says 143,000. There's some other digits there, and they're not important. And, of course, that's referring to miles. And then if you look at my odometer, it says 145,000. And that clever bit of marketing is a warning. It's a warning that there's impurities in the very heart of my car. In the oil that keeping the engine running, there's impurities, and I need to do something about that. Now, is it a design flaw that there's impurities in the oil? No. That's how cars were designed, that the car can, because of the environment the cars are in, because it's burning gasoline, there's going to be bad things there that can potentially cause damage to the car, eventually leading to the car won't run anymore. But there's a plan to handle that. And the plan, of course, is to change the oil. It's really simple. Everyone who has a car, hopefully, is changing the oil. All right? Well, the same thing is true with our minds. All right? We live in a sinful world. We're out there involved. We're not in an enclave with just Christians. And even if it were, it wouldn't matter because sin is all around us. And because sin is all around us, we have thoughts and temptations that will get in our head. And we need to do something to protect ourselves from that. And what do we need to do? We need to renew our minds. And just like I renew my minds with changing the oil, I need, or renew my car by changing the oil, I need to renew my mind by doing something. And what is that thing? Well, I think the answer is found in Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praiseworthiness, meditate on these things. It's really simple. We need to Instead of letting our mind coast, or instead of letting our mind focus on things it shouldn't focus on, we need to think on good things. And what are those good things? Well, if we go to a very, very famous passage, once again back to David, Psalms 119. Probably many of you have memorized Psalms 119.11. It says, 
How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that's the key. We need to be renewing our mind with God's word. Now, um, I, I found that I've heard, and I, I grew up in a Christian church. I was saved at a very young age. I went to a Christian school. I've heard so many different sermons and so many different preachers come up and say, you need to read God's word. You need to pray. You need to meditate on God, right? I mean, I'm sure you've all heard that too. In fact, in this sermon series, a number of the other speakers have focused on that point. And oftentimes I see that as a duty. That's some kind of service I have to do to God. It's something that I have to do. It's like that chore. It's really like that dieting thing. It's something that is an onerous task that I have to do. And when I look at it that way, of course, it's very hard for me to do it. When, when I think, oh, I've got to read my Bible this morning. I have all these other things to do, but I need to read my Bible. And the likelihood is that I probably won't do it. But that's not at all what God intended. He intended for us to meditate on God's Word because it clears our mind. It renews our mind. It brings joy and peace and love and all those characteristics of good fruit into our mind. It's kind of like that lubricant or protection from sin in our mind. All right? So that's where I think the key is of self-control, is that the power of self-control that we can manifest is actually a power of keeping ourselves from a sin by meditating on God. Now, back um, at the beginning or earlier in the message, I posed the question of what fruit was, and I said I would have my own interpretation of fruit. And I'll be honest, this interpretation I'm about to give you is not really that much different than what some of the other people have said. And I think the answer is really quite simple. Fruit is the result of living my life. No matter how I live my life, I'm going to produce fruit. If I am acting out of rage or anger or jealousy or envy, especially if I, I have those thoughts and, or feelings in my head and mind, and I have interactions with my children or my wife, I'm going to produce fruit of, 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 you know, of, of sadness, or I'm going to produce fruit of unhappiness. I'm going to produce fruit that is bad for my family. When I have that interaction with other people, if I have those bad thoughts in my mind, or if I'm focusing on the wrong things, I'm going to produce fruit that is not God's fruit. The results will be bad. But if I can focus on God's word, I can have fruit that is pleasing to God. I can have results that are beneficial, that are good. Now, when I was thinking about this good and bad fruit, and this is how I tie in plumbing, I came up with the question of how do you tell good plumbing from bad plumbing? Now, that might seem to you be a pretty obvious question. And some of you might be tempted to say, well, good plumbing is that stuff that's all the copper and the PVC with the purple stuff on it. That's good plumbing. And bad plumbing is what they had on Gilligan's Island, where they have a bamboo log cut in half and water running through it, right? But that's not really bad plumbing. That's just a TV show. There is a difference between good plumbing and bad plumbing. And this is a lesson I unfortunately learned myself. So um, when I was younger... And to give you a time perspective, my wife at the time was pregnant with my 13-year-old daughter. She wasn't 13 at the time. She's 13 now. That gives you a, do the math there, all right? We decided that we were going to add an addition onto our home. We were going to add another bedroom. Uh, it's going to be on the second story above our kitchen. And just as a, a word to the wise of any young couples out there, especially men, if you're thinking it's a good time to do a major project and change your lives, I encourage you to do it while your wives are pregnant. They're, they're very helpful in understanding while they're pregnant. That's, that's a great timing, um, so think about that. So anyways, to save money on this addition, I was gonna, we hired a contractor to, to do the plans. He was going to do all the rough construction, but I was going to do all the finished stuff inside myself. And now I had had, my dad is a contractor, so I had some experience with some things, and I felt pretty confident I could do this. And most of them were pretty simple. It was just a bedroom. So I was going to have to finish off the walls and floor. I had to do the electrical. But our home is heated by hot water baseboard heat. So there was going to have to be some plumbing involved. Now, the other part of this, the great time to do additions, is in the winter. And so because when I needed to hook in the plumbing to our house, 
there was some of the work I had to do at the beginning of the project, but I couldn't finish it to the end of the project. So I needed to do the plumbing specifically so I could get it started at the beginning, but I couldn't turn off heat to the upstairs, and so I had to make it so I could keep heat to the upstairs while I waited for the project to finish, and then at the end, I would basically finish it off and we'd have heat. And I, I, I came up with a plan, and I did the plumbing, and it was difficult, and I had some problems. A another word of warning, don't burn your house down while you're putting in plumbing. That's also a bad thing. So um, I, I got it in there, and we waited for the construction to finish, and I waited for all the other parts of the finished carpentry to finish, and then we got to the plumbing last. And what I found when I was ready to do the last part of the plumbing was that my plumbing leaked. And so what's a couple drops of water, right? Well, a couple drops of water will ruin your house. I mean, it'll ruin the walls, it'll ruin the drywall, it'll ruin the ceilings. The, over time, the, the lumber will rot, you'll get mildew and mold. A couple drops of water is a bad thing. So what's the difference between good plumbing and bad plumbing? It's the plumber. So you could have good plumbing by a good plumber that works, or you could have plumbing by me, and it leaks. And that's what Paul is saying here in Galatians. He's saying, you can live your life through the power of God and have all these attributes in your fruit, in the results of your life, or you can live your life through something else. And when you live your life through something else, you're going to have sin leaking into your fruit. And that sin over time will destroy the value of the fruit. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.27 says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. He's saying here is I'm having self-control over my body, specifically self-control over sin, so that when I have preached to others, I myself should not be disqualified. And it's really simple. A Christian, like we talked about before, who has sin in his life, is he the example that we need out there for Christ? No, he looks like a hypocrite. And that's the problem. When we are trying to do our own plans, when we are trying to live our life and we allow sin, and I'm not saying big things, just little things, right? Over time, that sin will be like those drops of water in my walls and it will ruin your testimony. It will destroy your fruit. Now, the good news is that God understands that, all right? He knows that we are going to have sin, and it's not the end. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What he's saying there is he will clean the fruit. It's okay. We sin. That happens. We need to turn from that sin, and we can have good fruit. Now, there's a song that I learned when I was a kid, and I was involved with child evangelism as a teenager, and if you're ever involved with kids, they like songs that have a lot of emotions to them. And this song is a really simple song, and don't worry, I'm not going to sing it for you today, but I'm going to tell you the words. They're, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Now, as kids, what you do is you start down off small, and every time you say grow, you get bigger until you're, you have fruit out there, all right? You're a tree. But the second chorus is, don't read your Bible, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And of course, the kids, every time they shrink, they get smaller until they're laid out on the floor. And we can say that, all right, I know I need to have self-control, I know I need to keep sin in my lives, but you know what, I just try to keep an even keel, I just try to keep, you know, not trying to do too much, not trying to sin, but there's no middle ground with God. All right. There's only, we focus on read our Bible and we keep that protective layer from sin in our lives and we grow or we don't read the Bible and we don't have that protective layer and we sin. There, there's no middle ground. And that's really what I'd like to leave you as a focus point today is that I think the spiritual aspect of self-control is all about giving us the opportunity to produce good fruit. And I hope that's what you will do as we think about this. So let's finish off by praying, if we would. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk, and thank you so much for having me be able to look at self-control. And I'd ask that you would have that impact my life. Lord, I'd ask it also be an impact for everyone else here, that we would be able to go out and keep our minds on you so that we can keep from sin. In Jesus' name, amen.